Well, hi, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about NumPy, uh, the basics of arrays and vectorized computation, just some learning objectives. Again, just talking about NumPy, short for numerical Python. Uh, and it is a very important package for numerical computing in Python. And uh, there's things like being able to use arrays, specifically ND array, which allows you to use multiple dimensions and very fast algorithms and operations for um, in Python. And uh, things also like linear algebra, multiplication. So we'll be looking at all that today. And so it is a, a Python package. You can import it by saying import NumPy as NP. Um, and this is the recommended way of doing it. it, it Python has like certain ways of um, calling different packages and shortening their names. And uh, so in the book, they recommended using the standard convention as opposed to trying to uh, come up with a different name. And so it doesn't have uh, modeling or scientific functionality, but just understanding an arrays in particular um, is really important for anybody who is interested in Python programming. And so uh, that is why we'll be covering all of those things today. And so arrays are a fast and flexible container for large data sets. You can store multiple things of the same type together. And the really nice thing about arrays is that rather than having to use a for loop, uh, which can be very slow, you can use um, array operations on the whole block of text or sorry, of data and using the similar sort of, um, of syntax. And so the first sort of thing is like, how do we create an array? You can uh, do that using um, the NP array like so. Uh, and, and being able to uh, create a, a small array um, after you've imported the package. And then, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you can use uh, mathematical operations. And so across all of the different uh, indices of an array, so if we look at this array, the first uh, item is 1.5. After performing the operation, we have multiplied all of the elements by 10. And so now the first element is 15. And so uh, each of like the corresponding cells uh, um, have received that operation, again, without like using a for loop. So an ND array is, uh, is a multidimensional sort of object as well. And so, each array has um, two different features, well, multiple, but two that we're going to talk about is shape, which tells you the size of each dimension, and a D type, which uh, tells you the data type. So looking here um, in our original array, we had this uh, block and then this block. So when you uh, do um, array.shape, it lets you know it's a two by three shape. And that those are the dimensions. And then the D type will tell you um, the data type of the array. And so calling D type on R or, or object R <laughs> um, uh, lets you know that this is a float 64 uh, type. And so there are a lot of different types. There is a table in the book that lists all the different types, and we'll be talking about them a little bit more in a little bit. Um, but and in this particular one, as you can tell, it's uh, inferred a D, a D type without us having to specify what it is. Uh, any questions so far? Race makes sense. <laughs> Hooray, array. <laughs> cool. Uh, so then moving on. Um, so, oh, I don't know why I put this in a different chapter, but yes, you can create one-dimensional containers or you can create multi-dimensional containers and uh, you can do that using, uh, within NumPy, I mean, uh, using numpy.array function. And so here we've created a, a 1D array. And so once you have uh, created it, 
you can print the shape as we did before and the number of dimensions as we did. Or I don't think we did that before, but the number of dimensions is one. The shape, it tells you it has five different elements. And then for multi-dimensional ones, you can, um, uh, you can create one with the same function. So this one has uh, two dimensions. And again, we can run NP array on it and then see two different dimensions and the shape is two by four. And so there are special kinds of array creations uh, if you so choose. Um, numpy dot zeros and numpy dot ones create an array of zeros and ones uh, respectively, and then you can say how many of those uh, elements you would want. NP and uh, numpy empty creates one without any initialized values, and numpy a range creates a range that you specify. One important thing to note is that uh, at least when I printed numpy empty, um, it had like various different looks but it is important to note that it does not return an array of zeros uh, so in this example create an, an mp empty it looks like this but that's not a zero uh, it's uninitialized um, and so uh, the book warns to not assume that it's a zero just because it is a, it looks like a zero and so again like mentioned above uh, you can create a 1D sort of um, uh, of array. So, so this is 10 zeros in one dimension. Or you could create a multi-dimensional array. So again, specifying the number of rows of columns that we want that are filled with zero. And like mentioned above, uh, Wes creates or provides like a very long list of all the different um, functions that you can use with uh, with the array function if you would like. So here's zeros and here's ones, a range, and then the other ones that uh, you can use. Yes. And if anybody has any questions at any point, please just jump in because <laughs> I can't see your faces. And so uh, I briefly mentioned this, but for the data types for ND arrays, uh, the data type or the D type contains the, the metadata about it. And um, it NumPy immediately infers the D type if you don't specify exactly what it is. So in this example up above, um, if we run the D type because we didn't specify it, it inferred that it was a float 64. And so that's what we get. But we can also be explicit about it if we don't want it to be a float 64 and instead an integer 32. We can say um, D type and numpy integer 32 when we create the array and that shows here. In addition to that, you can also cast the D type, which means uh, change it. And so here we have created a new array called float array. And we're saying for array, um, take array like type, and then instead use as type to change it to float 64. So this previous one that was integer 32 is not going to be um, this, in, this new array with the D type of float 64. And in addition to uh, casting D types by providing the the type that we want, we can also use another array to cast D types. So in this particular case, int array is referring to the type of R1. I'm saying, oh, I'm sorry, uh, int array is referring to the D type of R2 um, and saying, take R1, change its type to the one of R2 and give me that D type in int array, which is now integer 32 again. And um, in the book, the author mentioned that you don't have to memorize all of these <laughs> if you're a new user, um, just generally understanding the difference between characters, and numbers, and booleans, et cetera. Uh, but here's you know, the long list of uh, D types in case you are interested. 
Cool. And so the next up is going to be arithmetic with the NumPy arrays. And so they are, again, important because of this, um, this feature of vectorization. So being able to do things on the various elements of the array without having to use a for loop. And so um, uh, this is generally really fast. It's much easier to write. And so it's a really a big um, benefit of being able to use uh, vectorization. And so another example of this is being able to multiply two arrays together. And so we have these two arrays. Um, and we could say r times r to create uh, the, the multiplication of that array. And then another thing is being able to um, propagate or, or um, apply the same scalar argument to every element in the array, again, without using a for loop. So in this case here, we're um, taking one over r for every element in the array. And so then the last thing is um, just noting that the comparisons between arrays, you can also do that as long as the arrays are of the same size. So in this case, we're checking to see is R2 larger than R, and uh, it will provide true or false depending on what the result is. And uh, in the book, uh, author mentions, we'll be talking about what happens if the arrays aren't of the same size, but in this case, uh, they're all in the same size. All right. So next up is indexing and slicing. And one thing that I thought was really candy from the book is that uh, the, by printing the array, you can very clearly see arrays in Python start with zero I'm coming from the R world where it comes with one. So it's very handy in terms of learning slicing just to be able to see <laughs> and get like a visual reminder of that. And indexing and slicing lets you select a subset of your data or individual elements depending on what you need. And so uh, for 1D ones like this one, and they're, they're uh, they, look exactly like how you would expect. So in this case, we want to select the six element, in which case here it is five, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so we can say, um, uh, take five by inserting it into these square braces, and then we get our result, which is five. And so if we want to select a range, uh, like within, the array, we can do that using a colon. So saying six through eight, um, it will be uh, five through eight. Oh, and I didn't print, apologies. Um, but to broadcast data means to switch out one element with the other. And so in this case, I'm not sure why I didn't show up, but this array should show uh, for those six through eighth elements that it is replaced with the number 12. I will fix that, apologies. And so one important thing to note that I have up here is uh, when you view an array like this and, and changing things up, it's a view and the data is not copied. And so in, if you change, yes, <laughs> if you um, change something, then it will be reflected in the source array. And if you want to not um, you know, accidentally change your source array when you're working with it, you have to explicitly copy the array like so. Um, otherwise, you might inadvertently change things that you didn't mean to. Uh, oh, and here it is. So this is the result of, of uh, this function. So we have sliced it. We've created a new object called r slice. Uh, with the six through eighth element of the original um, array. Okay. And then, uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting myself confused. Um, I'm not sure why it's not showing. Uh, and if anybody knows what I did wrong, please let me know. Uh, but my understanding is if you um, 
broadcast this data and then check it again. It should like the original uh, vector should already be changed. Oh, I think it, that's right here. So you've changed. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> um, I don't think there's anything wrong with this is where it's. This oh, it is? is? Oh, okay. Yeah. So maybe I'm just confused then. <laughs> yeah, welcome think, to the explanation. <laughs> I think if I understand it correctly, what happened is that um, we took a part of the original array, which is five, uh, so the six, seven, and eight element, and you changed those to 12. Mm -hmm. And then you assigned that, that kind of small array into something new called array underscore slice. Mm -hmm. And then you change something within that. So once you change something within that, it will change it both within the slice and within the original array. And that's what happened here. It changed, yeah. it changed, yeah. So the, the 12 was changed, uh, the, the, the numbers five, uh, so the numbers five, oh, six, here. seven were yeah. changed to 12, 12, 12. And then once you changed in the small slice from uh, from 12 to 1 to 3, it changed it in both in the array slice and in the original array. I see. Thank you so much. OK, so it sounds like what I did incorrectly here is this should say R instead of R slice. Yeah, yeah I think we could just you could just print both just to see, to see that it has changed in both of them. OK, let's see if I can do that really fast. Do it live. Ah, exactly like you said. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just going to say it again just so that I have it for my mind. So in this case, we have, um, oh, is it referring? To, I'm sorry. So why is it 12 here? So this is oh the, because I've broadcast it up. Yeah, here. yeah. Yes, yeah. awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, so the original uh, array was zero through nine. Here we've broadcast the six through the eighth element to 12, and so when you um, yeah, even if you've so if you print that out, then you'll see the six through the eighth element is now 12. And then if we uh, broadcast um, this to one, two, three, when in within the slice of the six through the eighth element and then print R again, we'll see that the first or like the second element, which is denoted by one is now one, two, three. Let me know if I got anything correctly. Thank you so much for your help. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I also faced a lot of difficulty with it, so I had to do it like multiple times. Yeah, yeah. I think what's confusing is, um, yeah, like I, at least like if if uh, you're not used to like things work arrays working like that and changing, even if you don't explicitly call the change, it's very new. So I really yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm used. I'm too used to the R way, where just like it takes yeah. a copy of things, the so changing it's, things, and then changing so many things at the same time is really confusing. So yeah. I think I'll probably just be using dot copy all the time. Yes, I, I right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. And uh, in this case, uh, you can also change all the values in an array using this. Uh, this operation called the bear slice. Uh, another thing that I'm realizing is, um, um, not that R does this like explicitly, but I need to get better at, uh, at printing my objects in Python. So apologies. Thank you for bearing with me. So we have used uh, the bear slice. And then by doing that, we're saying change all of I was going to see, um, change all of the values in this array to 64. And now um, our slice is all 64, 64, 64. And then moving on to higher dimensional arrays, uh, we have a lot more options than we do with one dimensional arrays. So uh, each index is now one dimensional arrays, like so. 
And so to slice, we can pass um, a, a list in order to select individual elements. And so I should have used the comma um, one. So this is one option we could do, say, R to D. We could do uh, within the square braces a zero and a two, or we could do R to D square braces zero comma two and square braces. And so um, in terms of like how to read this, this first one is the rows, the second one is the columns. And so what we're saying is uh, the first one here, so the zero um, denoted by the zero element, and then the uh, third element denoted by two. So zero, one, two, but pull out the three. And I also pulled this um, image because it took me a little time to grasp, like, how do I uh, think about all of these various different ways of, of slicing um, something that's two dimensional? And so, uh, again, just to run through another example in this um, multi dimensional array, you can say we want the zeroth uh, row and then um, the fourth, fifth, and sixth uh, elements. And so, zero and then one, zero, one, two. And three and four. Oh, I'm sorry. And then uh, something that we noted last class or last session and that I just forgot again is that this is not inclusive. And so it won't include five if you um, if you include it like so. Another thing to try and remember if you're coming from the R world. <laughs> Another thing is if you um if you just denote one of the dimensions, it'll reduce the number of dimensions. And so in this case, it'll only provide uh, that first row of one, two, and three. And in terms of assigning, uh, there's a lot of flexibility. You can um, just assign and say a nine to that entire first row like so. Or you can create, um, uh, you can do multiple steps within one. Uh, so in this case, this is like another R2D. I don't know why I created another one, but there we go. And then this is saying we want um, the second row, which is denoted by one, and the first element, which is denoted by zero, in which case it would be four right here. Or four right here. So that is slicing. And uh, there is a lot, a lot of things that you can do. I think um, just uh, trying to grasp with the different operations and things like that it clearly has taken me a while to like try and um, remember everything. But hopefully, that this is a good intro. And so, in addition, the NumPy arrays can also be sliced in the same syntax of the, as uh, what we just saw above. If we create a range um, of 10, and then we're saying that we want uh, the second element, which starts as one, to um, this, uh, the, sorry, the seventh element, one, two, three, four, five, or sorry, the sixth element, then um, you can do so using those square braces as, as above, and then using the colon to say that we want uh, all of those numbers. and um, then we can also use the colon to select a range without having to specify both sides. And so in this case, we're saying uh, we want the first row of R2D, which uh, as shown above is one, two, and three. And we can also pass multiple things. Uh, and so in this case, we want um, the, the first, sorry, I am still trying to uh, grasp and I can also misspell this. We want the three rows and then the first element, like so, up to the first. I have a question about this because I got really yeah. confused about this. Yeah. So uh, in the in the one where you say RT do, mm -hmm. sorry two D, and then you say uh yeah. Uh, column to three and then column to one i was wondering if i tried to do so column to one means that we're only selecting the first 
right? So that's the zeroth element, the zeroth column, basically, which is the first column. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you put zero to one, instead of just common to one, you, uh, you, get a, you get a different output and I'm trying to understand why. So um, yeah, yeah so, so here, um, okay. if you go, okay. sorry, if you go to line 294, mm -hmm. 94, yeah. Oh, so, 94, sorry. Yeah, yeah so if you, if you print this, it will give you one, four and seven, St st stack down each other, right? Yeah, sorry, I have to create this. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Oh no, my bad. Here you go. Yeah, so if you, so yeah, it's the one after it. Yeah. Like. <laughs> yeah, so it puts them one, four, seven. But if mm -hmm. you put zero next to it, and next to before the common, it will just put one, four, seven into one array. So I was thinking, uh, yeah, here. Oh. I got one for seven. Okay, I think it's probably something with my system then, because oh, yeah. when, when I do this, I get only one array, so only so only one braces with one comma four comma seven. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, Maybe okay. I did something wrong. Sorry, sorry for wasting oh, time. No, no, not at all. Um, uh, anybody have any insight on using like specifying? Yeah, I also, I also yeah. have a follow up question to what he just asked. Because looking at, uh, let's say, example, I have a data frame. You know, if you want to index, we use the square brackets. We make reference to the rows and also the column of interest. But now looking at this example, I am a bit lost because I saw in line 295, mm -hmm. you say array 2D, then you said 0 to 3, then comma 0 to 1. Which mm -hmm. one is the column? Which one is the row? Yeah, right, because up here, this was the row, right? Um, but in this case, it looks like it is taking like the first element of each row. Is that right? Yeah, I think I think I figured out what was wrong in my question. So what I what my question was is if you replace zero column one with only zero, it will list them as one. Yeah, it will list them as one rather than one, four, seven. And mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I thought that zero and zero column one are equivalent because mm -hmm. we always do not take the one on the right extreme. So it's not inclusive on the right side. So I thought I would get the same result, but I don't know why it's not the same. So if someone knows, that would really be helpful because I was really confused about it. Yeah. Is anybody aware? It looks like. Are you saying if you take array 2D of zero with no colons at all? Right. Yeah. In that case, you will get a different answer. You'll get a single dimensional array. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what happens. But when yeah. you do, when you do it with, uh, with the colon, you get a 2D array. That's the main difference. It keeps the shape of it as a 2D array. I don't know okay. why, but that's a, fe that's supposed to be a feature. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. In one case, you're selecting the particular row out as a single dimensional array. But the colon, will, colon selection will keep it to be the original uh, dimensions as it was. So you get a weird 2D array that's actually only got like one row <laughs> or a column. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'll just, it's a good, it's a good yeah, way, Isabella, as well. I think it's just, and you said, Ron, is just to think that the column will keep the dimension. So yeah. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you. And how about this question? So if you take uh, colon one, this is a row, right? The first, or, yeah, the first row of the array. But in this case, oh, I think it was this, right? Right? Uh, yeah. But in this case, this looks like it's taking the three rows. Oh, is that why? So this is like saying take the three rows and take the first element of the three rows. Is that right? Yeah. I see. So the first, um, I, is, is, would this be a parameter within this function is the rows and the second one is the columns? Yeah, it's row column. Row column. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah. There it is. The way they explain in the book is that when you take like, you take the, just the zero without any colon, you're not slicing, you're just taking an element. So the 2D array is, is an array of arrays. So you know, you pick taking one of those arrays out of that array of arrays. Just like it was an array of numbers, you get just a number back. 
But when you slice, you actually get back the same structure. It's actually true also when you slice a, uh, a S1B array, right? You go get an array back, but if you take a, a, a single element of it, you get an element, a number. Okay, so. I think if you do a 1D array and you slice it with a single, uh, you know, zero colon one, you, I mean, or colon one, you'll still get a 1D array back, which is one element in it, right? Oh. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Um, uh, can you see this? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, run through that. Yeah, those. you got it. There it is. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. R is, a, is an array, yeah. a zero through none. If we say we want just a single element, mm -hmm. um, we could put it in the square brass brackets. And if we want a single element maintaining the dimensions, is that right? We can use a, the colon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Oh, thank this you. Is just, yeah, this is just like how Python slicing works in general for lists. Like you slice a list, you always get a list. Even if it's only got one element, it's still a list. So they use the same um, kind of yeah. logic or language uh, is it, for this. Is it kind of similar in R when you have lists, if you put only one uh, one square bracket versus two square brackets? Yeah. It's like yeah. Because uh, yeah. Yeah. in the two square brackets, you get an element. But with the one square bracket, you get a list. Yes. Yeah. Similar to that, but yeah, the Python slicing produces the same kind of object back again. Thank you. That is very helpful. <laughs> cool. Uh, anything anybody else wants to add in this, this fun slicing adventure? <laughs> Isn't that cool? We can go into Boolean indexing. And so here we've created an array um, uh, called names, with a bunch of names, and then another one called data with, with a bunch of numbers that's multidimensional like so. And so similar to the above, if we use a Boolean comparison, um, then it will be vectorized, so it'll be applied to every element within the array, and then I'll return a true and a false. And so here we're looking for names uh, equal to Bob from names, and so for every Bob, it'll return true. Yeah, like so. And so in addition, you can index the array by passing the Boolean um, and doing so is like saying in our data, give me uh, the indices where it equals Bob, I believe. All right. And then we can also select the rows where the names equals Bob and, and index the columns too. So you could do multiple operations uh, at once. And then there's two ways of saying like select everything but a particular thing. And so um, saying select everything but Bob, but Bob, this is the negation operation, or you could do um, this syntax as well. And so um, if you're coming from the R world, you uh, may know and and or. So that's another option in addition to um, seeing whether things are equal. So create this array called mask where names are Bob or names are Will. And then it, it checks to see each of those elements, whether it matches this criteria, and then returns it about or an array. And so you can also do substitution uh, with Booleans. And um, so in this case, saying for all of the data that's less than zero, replace it with zero. Very, very common operation I find in, in data. And so you can do that as well. Or you could say for all the names that are not equal to Joe, change it into seven as well. That one's not as common. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't often change Joe to seven. <laughs> um, yeah, any any questions on that or thoughts or tricky things we should look out for as we're learning Python? <laughs> if not, there's also Fanby indexing, which is uh, a NumPy term. 
and then it's indexing using uh, integer arrays. And so here we have an eight by four array, all these numbers. And you can just pass uh, another array of integers to specify the order of the things that you'd like. So in this case, we're saying we want four, three, zero, and six, and we get it back in that order, which is really nice. And then negative indices uh, select from the end. Oh, I didn't put the example, I'm sorry. But it does, I promise. <laughs> um, great. Oh no, here it is. Here's the example. So it's saying you know, negative three, I want um, the third from the end, and et cetera. And here is another array that we created. And we can select with multiple um, uh, arrays. We don't just have to give it one to say, you know, we want this row and we want um, this column uh, or, or like the elements uh, corresponding to this row and to this column. So, uh, so the first, well, the row denoted by one would be here. And we want the zeroth element, which is four. So we are given four. And so unlike slicing, fan and C indexing uh, copies the data into a new array, um, which is, uh, again, may be familiar for some of us, and, but an important thing to note when things are copied versus when they are not. And then this is a familiar tool, especially if you're coming from the Excel world, <laughs> I think. Uh, transposing arrays using uh, this special attribute, the T attribute. And so creating an array, a range of 15, um, three by five, we can transpose by saying um, dot T, adding dot T to the end of that array. So now it's five by three. And for folks who need to do um, matrix uh, computations, uh, you can do it um, use various functions from NumPy to be able to do that. So um, if you have to multiply matrices, you can do so by r dot t times r, or you can also use this other operator, uh, the at sign, to be able to um, multiply matrices, whatever you're interested in. They are equivalent like so. And so there is a special method called swap axes, axes um, from ND array. And so it, uh, it gives you a little bit more control over the sorts of things that you want to do. And so um, if you take this array, you can say like, um, you can indicate certain axes to, to rearrange the data. This one, and again, if anybody has like additional insight, but I had to, kind of like look at it for a while and have already forgotten <laughs> exactly what it did. So, Cool. Yeah, what is this uh, just like a generalization of a transpose then or is it doing something different? Yeah, I think this one seems to be exactly what a transpose is, but let's play around with it. Um... This may be useful if we have more dimensions. That's oh, I see. So let's say. I don't know how it would work. Cool. Add more dimensions, you think? Oops, that won't work. We can do that. Three, five, six, let's say. So this is our original array. So what happens if we say like zero, two? Oh, nope. It seems to. I think because our array is still at two dimensions, isn't it? Yeah, so if, if, you, put, if you put shape, that's the... Yeah, it looks the same. Is there anything that would make it? Uh, it looks like, yeah, it's just a NumPy way of 
transposing. Hmm. Cool. If anybody gains some insight on sweat axis, please let me know. Cool. So another handy thing for um, for data is using the numpy dot. I guess I see. the numpy.random module. And so it supplements the Python random module. And then to create all sorts of pseudo random numbers um, following different sorts of probability distribution. And so here is a four by four array of samples using uh, the standard normal probability distribution for the random numbers. And so one thing to note, it's just a lot faster than the built-in random module, which is one of the reasons that you may want to uh, use the NumPy's instead of uh, the built-in one. And so if you have seen this before in R, um, seed it determines the state of the generator. And so if you are looking to reproduce your results or anything like that, you may want to set a seed uh, using, and then the random number generator like so. And so uh, that way, like every time that you run this code, it will produce the same result. Otherwise, it will give you another set of random numbers. So very handy to get. And here we've used standard normal as our random distribution, but there are a bunch of other options, as you can imagine. If you want to use binomial distributions or normal distributions, etc. So again, I'm sure this will come up again. Uh, in this book. <laughs> cool. And next up is universal functions. And so they provide or perform element wise operations. And so, again, uh, everything I do is related to R. I just think about like mutate mean versus mutate summary and how many and like how those um, are applied to the various, to the different elements of what you provide the function. And so uh, some are, again, pretty simple in terms of like how they are um, applied to every element within a, an array. So if we have a range, again, 0 through 9, we can say use square root from NumPy, and then it does apply to every single element in the array. So um, square root of 0, square root of 1, square root of 2, et cetera. And then in addition, there are some of these universal functions that you can use on uh, more than one array, array at once. And so in this case, you're saying, I want the maximum between these two different arrays. And so the output is a single array, um, but it has reference to separate arrays to give you the result. And you can go beyond that too. You can get in a, um, you can apply these universal functions to three different uh, parts. So in this case, it's saying like, give me, um, oh, I don't quite remember what this is called, but the array provides you the uh, remainder of um, whatever it is that you're providing. So one, two, and multiple. And so, if you would like, you can also use this out argument. And so uh, then this assigns the results to an existing array rather than create a whole new one. Cool. All right, next up is array oriented programming with arrays, of course. <laughs> uh, and so. Sorry, uh, like I mentioned before, there's um, the sorts of things that you do and you expect to get one result back, like check the maximum of two different arrays, you'd get an array of the maximum between those two different arrays, but then you can also do uh, something across um, all of the elements again with vectorization. And so if we create this array, that's a, a set of points, 100 equally, space points using this function called meshgrid, which seems pretty neat. Um, 
you can evaluate them uh, as if it were two separate points. And so, whoop. awesome. And here is a link about transpose and swap axes. Thank you. I'll keep it so that I don't lose it. So you can um, do this operation across the two different arrays as if like they were points, and but they're actually arrays. And so they're um, raising the exponent to two for both of them and then adding them together. And this is pretty neat uh, he includes in the book just a visualization of what all those points look like after you have um, applied this uh, this function to them. I thought that was pretty. <laughs> And then you can close plots using all. I've only used Python a little bit. I remember like doing this was important. <laughs> so. Cool. And so another uh, useful function is this numpy.where. And so it is another version of this x if condition else from Python. And so uh, they can, in addition to arrays, um, you can also pass scalars to numpy.where, and or you can uh, combine scalars and arrays. It doesn't just have to be arrays. And so um, in this case, it's saying, like, if take the, arg uh, the value from xr, where the corresponding value in condition is true, and otherwise take it from yr. And so in this case, uh, for the first one, right? It would say this is true, and so we're going to take it from XR. This one's false, and so we're going to take this from YR. And so running this with X if condition else looks like this, or you could use numpy where. It seems like a very handy function. There's a lot less writing involved to be able to do that, where you give it the condition, the X and the Y. And like mentioned above, it, you can also do it with. Um, with different uh, data types. And so saying like, if, the, if it's greater than zero, uh, then make it two. And so if it's not, then make it negative two and apply it like so. And another one, if it's greater than zero, do two. And if not, leave it as it was in R, like so. Oh. This is the, the one that I was like mentioning above, that in addition to um, doing things like square rooting all of the elements in the vector, there's also aggregations like summarize if, if you use that in from a dplyr. And so things like sum and mean and a, a standard deviation will only give you one result back as opposed to a result for all of the different elements within a vector. And so there, again, as usual, two different ways of doing this. You can uh, use the mean function, the built-in mean function, um, or you can use NumPy's uh, mean function and get equivalent um, results. But one important thing to know is if you're going to use NumPy, you have to um, pass the array as an argument, whereas here you could do uh, r.mean. So. And you can also run these by on specific axes, like axes, actually. Um, so here, one is always denoted by columns and two, and zero is uh, rows. So here is saying like, give me the mean and for, um, for these particular columns. And this is give me the mean for, for the rows. And QSUM is like above, it does not aggregate, but produces the array of all of the results. QSUM um, adds each element like to the one before in progressive order. And so one, two, and three, so that would be one, three, six, et cetera. And so, um, so it's a different kind of aggregation. Uh, so it does produce an array as opposed to a single um, number. And similarly, you could say, I want to cum uh, sum across an, a column or, or across a row specifically.
And then for Boolean arrays, uh, they are colors to one and zero for true and false, respectively. And so um, you can also use some, say, if you want to count up all of the all the ones or equivalent to all the trues in a particular array. So saying, you know, give me all the arrays greater than or all the elements greater than zero, in which case it would be a, a one, and then sum them all up and give me the result. And so there's 13 positive values. And there's any tests and all tests. And so any checks to see whether anything is true and all checks to see if uh, everything is true and then gives you the result. And so in this vector, there is one true. So using any on it gives us true back. All right, and then sorting, you can sort in place using sort. And so, oh, it does not print. I need to write print. Um, let me just uh, do this really fast. Uh, sorry, I had to find where I view. So we have this, um, this, these random numbers from the stand, nor, normal distribution, and then we could say sort, and then printing that. Oh, that doesn't work. Sorry. It should sort it. Does anybody know how to show the result? Uh, it just applied it to array. Yeah, exactly. Ah, thank you. Yes. Because it is, um, that's right, it's not copied. <laughs> awesome, thank you. And so here is the, uh, the result of the sort. And you can, like, uh, give some above. You can also sort, oh, sorry. You can compute across the columns, or you can compute around, across the rows. Uh, like we did above. And then NumPy sort uh, does not modify the array in place. And so um, again, <laughs> I still have to uh, really, really get this in my head, <laughs> the whole uh, printing and, and things like that. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, but similarly, you can use NumPy sort to, to sort a vector, or sorry, an array. A few other important functions to know, uh, unique, you know, it provides a unique values in an array in a certain way. Uh, and then there's also in 1D, which tests the membership of one array um, of the elements in one array with another and gives you a Boolean result. And a couple other important things is saving and loading data. Uh, and so you can also save arrays and then load the arrays depending on when you need it. If you have multiple arrays, uh, you can use save Z and you can also use save Z compressed if your data compresses well. All right, and then uh, there's a ton of things <laughs> that you could do for linear algebra if you need uh, within, within NumPy. And so I think we saw this already, but like in, you could use the a dot function um, to do some dot multiplication. And uh, this is um, one example of a random walk, in which case uh, for each step, it does um, a random sort of uh, either um, increases or decreases the value, and then uh, we can generate that for 100 steps and see what happens, in which case uh, it's, here is just a plot of what the result is. So just to show some, some real Python code being run um, with the things that we mentioned above. Yeah, and that's all I had. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Anything uh, anybody wants to add or? Uh, I'm sure there's a ton I missed, hopefully not misrepresented, but really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah.
Thank you. That was really, really helpful. <laughs> good. I'm glad. Happy to try out anything. Too. <laughs> yeah, good job. That was very, I think you pretty thorough on that. Ah, thank you. Yeah, I think um, what will be interesting is like really trying it <laughs> and like i have being like, why is this suddenly a 12? And it's like, oh, yeah, that's because, you know, it wasn't copied or things like that. So that will be fun. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, for me, thank you very much. Uh, for yeah, thanks so. all. Yeah, thanks. Presentation, you know. but I have an issue. Sure. Because I discovered the book, the initial version was a QMD. So mm -hmm. I discovered this evening, I updated the book that was pushed to get up to the, Q the Quarto. Mm -hmm. So I discover if I am running Quarto CMD render to HTML on my house studio terminal, but I'm getting an error that the pipe is being enclosed and I cannot render the book. Oh, okay. Are you on a Windows or a Mac? Windows, Windows. I think there's something about the Windows command that is slightly different, but um, maybe I can message you afterwards so that I can note the, the error down. And anybody run into this? I think I have the book open. I can even share my screen so that you see it. Oh, sure. I have a book, let me see, yeah. Yeah, this is it, this is my terminal. So once <laughs> I run, uh, Quato, once I run, once okay. I run this command in my terminal, it will run, but at the end it will return this error we are seeing. Yeah. Um... Does it stop out at a particular one? It looks like it yes. stops at three. It's going to stop at the starting Python. I think it's the Python in starting Jupyter kernel. It just could stop at this point. Okay. Can you open 03 underscore notes, please? 03. Uh, underscore notes. See. Actually, I can open it. Let me see 03. I think it's, it's already this, it's already open, no? It's, it's open. Yeah. Oh, it is. Um, could you scroll? Oh, yeah, it was the one that was open. Could you scroll up to the top? I think this is the top. Oh no, this book. is uh, this one's main. Um, it's the file right before this one that you have open. Oh, the tab just the notes. Left. These are our notes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This and is can we see what the YAML looks like at the top? Uh, it has no YAML. Oh, it has no YAML. Okay. Um, does it have any YAML? No, it does not. <laughs> yeah, John, John had asked that we leave the YAML off because it's yeah. the YAML's defined in uh, elsewhere. I got I, it. I, the I'm YAML confused. is defined somewhere here at the, let me see. I think in the, the quarto underscore, the underscore yamil, yamil. quarto. Yeah. Yes, the YAML is defined here. I see, okay. It, it's okay. interesting, the notes file really has no code. It's just marked down. Oh, yes. Okay. What if you try to render that one by itself? Does that, does it work? Like just go through 03 notes.qmd? Yeah. The one that was giving trouble, that one, no? The, the one that the one zero three notes dot qmd zero three okay yeah. zero three notes i think now, this one this one is going to render i think so it's going to render so it's not okay what does it say is there a zero Jupiter three is not available oh well, there's a problem <laughs> ah, kind of install jupiter oh yes <laughs> that would uh, maybe try that and see the conda install jupiter or uh, you might double check your, uh, which environment, are you using the book Conda environment? So you might have to say Conda activate and then and then your book environment. Yeah. Um, and and, and that one's got, on that my got terminal. me too. That is try, on my try, time. yes, right there, try Conda ENV list. Yeah, just a quick note. Like, Porto can run without any programming language, but if you try to run code, it does need the engine installed. Said conda command not found. Oh, it had to install. Well, that's odd. 
have have you installed the conda in um yes uh, yes hmm. oh is it because you're using minji w is that i wonder why it's right does it always use minji w for r studio i should type is it mvw no, no, I'm just asking you. It looks like it's using MinGW, which is a Unix clone thingy for Windows. Um, but that's if you don't know, if you're not familiar with that, that means there was something that happened automatically. So don't worry about that. How about it? Try and did, install Jupyter. Yeah, or if you type Conda, does it do anything? Does it activate anything? Or is it do not activate anything? Conda do not activate anything. Yeah. Um, so, so th there, there, there may be a path issue then in Windows where w Windows doesn't know here how to find your Conda installation. Okay. Yeah. Um, there I, is... That's. Go ahead. I'm oh, oh no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um... I, 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 I had, I had struggled some with that to to modify the path appropriately. If you go to tools okay. and then global options. Yeah. And then Python. Okay. Yeah. I think yeah. it here you can select your environment um, or your sorry, your installation. So ah. Nice. I'm, this is actually very helpful for me too, because I was about to start messing around with this on Windows, but I have not done that yet. So <laughs> There okay. you go. I should pick Yay. which is it 3.10.1 or they are the same. Yeah, but you may want to go to the environments tab and see the the conda environments, maybe. That's okay. Oh, okay. Here you go. Nice. Yeah, there's one 3.10.5, which is the Pi data book. Get down, down. This. No, the one before it. The one. Okay. Yeah. I should I, I should click on this. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Selected. Select. Yeah. Selected. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. So let me apply. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ooh, so I yeah, right. We're all like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to it's going to compile now. The way I see, it. it's going to work. Let me recompile. Slow is going slow. Did you run the the command? No, no. I'm trying to screw up, but the system is going slow, maybe because oh, okay. we are on a Zoom. Yeah. So it's going to be quatos.cmd. Yeah. I use the up arrow. Brenda. Me too. <laughs> G3. So HTML. Yeah. So there's going to be a book. I'm holding my breath. Yeah. <laughs> Here it goes. Right, <laughs> it looks like it's working. It's yeah. going to work. Yeah. <laughs> so tools, settings. Yes, global right, option. Gotcha. Yes. Perfect. Cool. Hey. <laughs> hey. All right. Compiling okay. is coming. I think everything is okay now. It's compiling. Yeah, yeah. I 
think if you do quarter render, you might not see the preview, but if you do, maybe I'm wrong. Um, I always do quarter preview and only render when I'm gonna push up. Hi, and I've searched so many online for. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm so I glad. Think, uh, this is. The book is not coming up. Oh, I have to. Yeah. It, so if you go into the docs folder okay. um, and open that index.html. Index.html. And then open in browser. Yes. Yep. Open in browser. I think, yeah. Let me reshare so that you see. Okay. And if you want to you like have it show up and view your changes anytime you want to save your file then you yes. do porto preview instead okay hey i think this is the book it. yes thank you very much okay. so well, you're doing you. uh isabella when you did yours did you use r studio or did you use like visual code to uh, Studio yeah. code yeah i, I use, was using... i use r studio yeah, I was but now I want to switch to VS Code because I really like the syntax in VS Code. Uh, I haven't tried VS Code. I was doing it originally in Jupyter Lab because I wanted to learn Jupyter Lab, but then our studio is so much easier, so I switched back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I tried using uh, I tried using Jupyter Lab first, then VS Code. And I and then I switched to our studio like throughout the chapters like and I think our studio is like the easiest for me so far. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Maybe I'll try that. Holy tabs, Batman! <laughs> 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 I thought that was bad. Well, thank okay. you all so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you again yeah. for bearing with yeah. me. It's, <laughs> I'm truly a Python beginner. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Have bye -bye. a good night. Bye. Yeah, bye, everyone. Bye.